My upbringing possibly shaped me as a scientist, mostly because I was fortunate. I did not influence this. I was fortunate to be born into a, a family which was relatively mindful compared with many American families, which are mindless. Uh, my parents, who were not at all scientists, but nonetheless, they were well-educated. They graduated from college during the Depression, which was very rare for American adults. And then they got, as is often the case when you achieve an education, they got mindful jobs. My father was a newspaper reporter. My mother was a school teacher. These are, these are white collar jobs, not labor. And so the atmosphere in the home was relatively mindful without being yelled at by my parents to do well in school or something. It was just a good atmosphere in which to be raised. And that made me realize when I was a baby that school, education is not torture. It's interesting. It's not just a chore, a daily chore. And I really liked my science courses in high school, for example. And that made me interested in going on to college to try to become a, a physician, a doctor. Um, but halfway through college, I lost interest in that totally. <clears throat> but in many American colleges, if you want to become a physician, uh, an MD, you major in, uh, we say we major, that's a, word, a verb, you major in biology. That's what I was doing. So I just stayed in biology, no more pre-med interest, and I, I just decided to go on in biology after college. But all of this did go back to being in an atmosphere. My, my father, for instance, taught me sports, and we went to many sports matches many kinds. That was very interesting. I, I spent way too much time wallowing in sports. But he told me, I'll never forget it, one morning he said, will you stop going to the sports pages in the morning paper initially, every morning? Read the front of the paper sometimes. For, for example, to not just to be a typical American adolescent teenager where you're a you know, boasting about the fact that you don't know anything and that school is, is ridiculous and, and not cool. And so th that's what influenced me to, I mean, when, if you're a researcher in science without necessarily boasting, it, it's a mindful occupation. You have to know things. You have to learn about factors and phenomena and technology it, it's very valuable to read what we call the literature in your field, to not just to keep up, but because it's often interesting. And, and so this, so I had a similar vocational experience to my parents, who for a total of almost 100 years of time had mindful jobs. Obviously, if you're a journalist, you're not cutting down trees in a forest. It's not physical labor. It's, it's words and ideas and events. And same with a school teacher. My mother taught English. I, I, I found it uh, to have a mentor, uh, which I had two crucial mentors in my time. I was very fortunate. I didn't realize at the time how lucky I was. I had a mentor in college, uh, which there was, that's very rare that mentoring even in the old days was in college is very low level uh, stuff. But this guy was a genuine mentor. He was a very well-regarded researcher nationally and even internationally. But nobody at the college knew that. He was ridiculed because he could not be a member of the regular faculty, because he had gone deaf as a young man in the 1930s. He was a graduate student in this. This is relevant to this year's Nobel Prize. He was a graduate student working under Alfred Sturtevant, who in turn worked under Thomas Hunt Morgan, 
the first Drosophilus to receive the Nobel Prize. I didn't know this at the time. But he was, uh, I was doing a little research project under this man, his name was Phil Ives. And instead of solely instructing us how to do the project, which was trivial, undergraduate, he also self-consciously told the people working under him, a small number of students, he was not permitted to teach classes. He was just a researcher. And he was regarded very poorly. Everybody said, you have this job as a charity because you went to that college when you were younger and you grew up in the town in the middle of Massachusetts in US East. And they said, you got a charity acceptance to the college. And then you got later a charity job because you were deaf and nobody would hire you for the standard PhD biologist job. And so he was looked down upon, very minor character ostensibly in this biology department, as it was called. But he was the, about the only one actually doing any research. But he was superb at uh, cranking up enthusiasm and motivation for the small number of students working under him doing minor research projects. But also he said, I want to teach you all you students, you trio or quartet, what he called the lore of Drosophila, how it all started, where and how, when, which went back to his academic grandfather, who was by then the famed Thomas Hunt Morgan, the first Drosophilus to be awarded the Nobel. Who would have ever imagined Morgan himself when he started in 1908, 1909, 1910, would never have imagined that their genetics findings would come to be regarded as so, so significant, which they were. And he was the boss, even though he, the people who knew Morgan knew that he didn't, wasn't really very good at what he was doing. But the boss gets awarded the prize, not, not the actual researchers, <laughs> who was a famed trio of his students, who were some of the best biologists in the history of biology. Sturdivant, Muller, who won the Nobel Prize in the 40s. And then there was uh, Calvin Bridges, another superb geneticist. Everything that the three awardees this year have done, we could have done none of it ever if it hadn't been for those three Drosophilists working under Morgan. Morgan was such a flake that he, he, he started studying fruit flies because he wanted to study cell biology and development, not genetics. He, he'd never heard of genetics. Very few had at the time. It was, but what sparked my interest, this was a, another remarkable coincidence, which I would have never was strange and very helpful in retrospect. Uh, when I was a, taking a course in college, uh, one of the t teachers in the course had, was a wet behind the ears assistant professor, as we say. He just started a faculty job. He went from his PhD work at Princeton in New Jersey immediately to a faculty job. That was common at the time. Later, you had to do postdoctoral research for two, four, now typically five, seven years before you can get a faculty job. He went straight from his PhD. And so what? Well, the so what with the he had worked on Drosophila rhythms for his PhD under a then famous rhythm researcher. This was not genetics. It was just rhythmic biology. And so this guy was teaching a course on evolution about which he knew nothing. It was not in his background. So he put into this course on evolution a module about Drosophila rhythms. Be out of desperation. But it was very interesting. It was not germane to the course. He still works at that college, and I became much more close with him professionally and personally later on. And I talked about, I said, his name is Bill Zimmerman. I said, Bill, I don't know if you were doing more than you knew to us students when you were teaching us about rhythms. 
but it was nonetheless just intrinsically interesting. So I started to learn about daily rhythms, which I'd never heard of. And one way to learn about daily rhythms in animals or anything is via the early days of fruit fly research, um, studying rhythms, albeit not genetically. But then after college and then after grad school, I, I went to Caltech to be a postdoctoral because that was becoming more and more necessary. And one of my lab mates was the person who started the entire genetic approach to studying rhythms. He was a grad student there in that lab at Caltech. And, and I got to know him very well because we had personal interests that overlapped in rock and roll music and profanity and beer drinking. And, but in addition, he had done this PhD thesis research on, rhythm, on genetic, taking a genetic approach to study daily rhythms. And I perked up because it was superb research as such. But also, I, I understood what he was doing and why, because I had, by a pure coincidence, been exposed to rhythmic phenomenon a few years before in Drosophila. There, there's a Drosophila species called Drosophila melanogaster. That's the species which is studied in such a heavily genetic manner, which has led to five Nobel Prizes, melanogaster. But there's another, there's many Drosophila species, and one of them, believe it or not, is called Drosophila pseudo-obscura. It's only pseudo-obscura, apparently. And it's the species that was used going back to the middle of the previous century and before, the species used to study rhythms although not genetically, because you can't, there's not much genetic background involving pseudo-obscure. It's all melanogaster. That's the species that Morgan's lab pioneered and started to generate all this genetic information and genetic materials. There's more known about Drosophila melanogaster than the sum total of all genetic knowledge about any organisms, any and all organisms. The, and of course, the Genomics is completely known in Drosophila melanogaster. That's the species they chose to do genomics in terms of fruit flies because there's so much additional genetic knowledge going back more than 100 years. Uh, nobody, uh, uh, nobody knows this, nobody needs to know, but Morgan, somebody at Morgan's lab noticed an anatomical anomaly for one individual fly back in 19, before 19, just before 1910. Some people claim it's the famed white eye mutant. That's false. It was a, a mutant on the back end of the fly which had an anomalous, slightly anomalous appearance. <clears throat> it was a mutant called Wyth, which says nothing. And that's long disappeared. Nobody studied it much. The white eye mutant became famously studied uh, by Morgan himself and especially his students. Um, in fact, one reason that the first clock gene that was identified molecularly could be identified was because it is located very near the white gene. And that part of the fruit fly genome in melanogaster is one of the most heavily studied subsets of the genome. There's vast amounts of genetic knowledge about it which permitted it to be isolated molecularly. So this is another example of how our predecessors, unbeknownst to them at the time and unbeknownst to us when we were doing it, we couldn't have done anything without all this background. We're not aware of all of our senses. We're aware of sights and sounds and visual inputs. We're not aware of another sense, which is the sense of balance, which is a mediated by sensory and central nervous system. And by a loose analogy, what you said about rhythmicity being something of a sixth sense, we're unaware of our daily fluctuations, most of them. But they seem, because they're so widespread for a given organism and among organisms, they're so ubiquitous that they seem as if they must be important. And it must have been important for life when it arose on this planet over three billion years ago to cope with 
the location of this body in the solar system. Some people and many scientists are aware of the revolution of the Earth and changes in seasonal changes and also the rotation of the Earth, which creates these relentless 24-hour cycles. And, and so to cope with mostly fluctuations between light and darkness, which occurs in most parts of the Earth all year, except like in northern Sweden, um, but some people say, wait a minute, sees there are changes in the seasons. I say, yeah, but the cycles are still 24 hours. Yes, there's different amounts of darkness in the winter compared with the summer, like here when it gets dark at 3, or 1,500, as you'd have it. Um, but it's still a 24-hour cycle, and it's relentless. And, and so it seemed as if to cope with these relentless environmental cycles that the origin of life had to so cope. That's a cavalier argument that can be made about the fact that the clock genes and clock mechanisms are so similar from microbes to mammals, which is one of the consequences of our kick-starting a molecular genetic approach, which then people have found similar, my God, these free flight clock genes are everywhere. And there's not 700 of them per species. There's maybe a dozen core clock genes. That's tractable. That can be figured out. Konopka himself, when he was finding his, he found three remarkable mutants out of 2,000 tries. That's better than zero. But what if he found 400? What do you, how do you cope with this avalanche of novel? It was just three. Tractable. Uh, and that's how the whole clock molecular genetics story unfolded. He said, it is a crucial uh, dozen or so, low double figures worth of clock factors, genes and their products, which are proteins, which are acting and interacting to form and operate the daily clock in cells, including our cells, and including especially in our brain. So this was, it, we are fortunate to study a phenomenon which is A, interesting, and B, tractable. What if we were going to have to deal with a network of hundreds of interacting genes, we would be floundering around for decades. And, but we could plow through, my God, when Mike, Mike Young, who did amongst the best work, we all put our findings together. We said, my God, you know, we have something like 70 mutants. But, and they could define 70 genes, which is a nightmare. But the 60, 70 mutants defined 10 genes. That means when you hit a, a gene and get a novel rhythm problem with your new mutant, it's a gene that which was hit before. And he said, wow. And that's, that's just a good fortune because we didn't set up the organisms to be that way. We had to find out if that was the case, which we did, all along the way finding out more than we ever intended. <laughs> But it, the whole thing was just extremely good fortune, all the way back to when this guy uh, uh, taught me about rhythms because he didn't know anything about evolution, which was the course. Well, we were, we met in the middle of the 1970s, shortly before he came to Brandeis University. I had already come there a short time before we met. He was going to join the faculty one, about one half year after I did. And he came to meet me when he made a trip to kind of help him gear up to start his job a little later. And he came to meet me. I'd never heard of him. He was just a postdoc. Nobody's ever heard of those people. And he told me that he was coming to Brandeis to do research in molecular biology, studying populations of DNAs and RNAs. RNAs being the primary gene products. And I knew about that kind of research because I had been instructed 
about it when I was in grad school. I found it very interesting. Um, and so it wasn't like he said, I'm going to study this, and I might have said in another situation, I don't know what you're talking about. I don't care. Go away. No, I said, oh, that's interesting. I'm, I'm glad there's going to be somebody on the faculty doing that work. And he said, well, I hear that you work on fruit fly genetics and behavior genetics and neurogenetics. I said, yes, that's what I'm trying to start doing. He said, well, but none of that's molecular. I said, no, of course not. It can't be. It was the mid-70s. He said, but maybe we, maybe we could join forces later in life and merge my molecular expertise with your genetic, biological, neuro behavior. I said, sure, let's pencil that in for <laughs> eight years. Astoundingly, we did uh, start to work together in the early, mid-80s, as he imagined. But at the time when he proposed this upcoming conceivable scenario, it did not and could not have had anything to do with anything particular. But what we mutually decided to do was to join forces to work on rhythms, genetically and molecularly. Um, but along the way, we were fortunate. We, we got to be fairly close as colleagues and friends because this is similar to me in the great Ron Kanapka. Rospesh and I had similar outside interests especially sports, and especially profane misbehavior, which we did often in planned ways and thought it was very funny, nobody else did. We did, and sometimes spontaneous misbehavior. And, uh, and pop music and getting together in groups and to carouse and drink beer and watch sports and movies. And, and so along the way, in the, through the 70s into the early 80s, we couldn't help occasionally mention to each other uh, about research-related matters that had to do with his interest and my interest. And I, uh, I couldn't help mention to anybody that I knew about Konopka's incredible breakthrough in, in the Caltech, uh, which I knew about, and I'd gotten to know Konopka quite well personally. But Neither Ross Besh nor I at the time, 70s, had any interest in doing any things, anything having to do with Kanapka's genetic, what we call chronogenetic discovery. Taking a genetic approach to study rhythms and potentially to study the clockworks, which happened. And nobody, even Kanapka himself, couldn't have imagined that where it would go, 80s and beyond. In part because Kanopka left science prematurely, retired when he was in his 40s, of all things. But anyway, uh, so when we decided to work together, we had a personal connection. And Ross Besh himself couldn't, have, everybody would agree that what Kanopka had done and found was fascinating. We said, let's springboard off that which is what Mike Young independently did, the same thing. Young knew about Konopka's discovery back in the late 70s when he was a grad student. And he independently said, gee, if this rhythm genetic bibbledy boo is going to really mean something more broadly, more broadly based and deeper, it's got to go molecular. It can't be just mutants and rhythmic attributes alone. It's got to go molecular, which is correct. I mean, every imaginable, I mean, Jesus, the Nobel Prize awarded to Drosophilus in the mid 90s, this stemmed from mutants. But it was because those mutants pointed to genes which went molecular that those three were awarded the Nobel Prize. Um, they went molecular in fruit flies, and then people used those molecular materials to found that there were similar genes all over the place. And that's why the work of those three Drosophilus became so significant, involving work that they didn't even do, but they promoted, in starting with this humble little insect. And that's the same thing in the rhythm business. 
are the clock genes identified in Drosophila, people now were starting automatically without even thinking about it, looking for molecular relatives in other like mammals and not expecting to find them. Maybe they didn't even want to find them, but they did. So our work became much more significant than we would have ever imagined, at least in part thanks to the work of others who went to school on our findings and materials. I, I found it a privilege to study rhythms because they're so interesting. They just are, for, I think, for anybody. Uh, that lots of science is gibberish. Rhythms are not. To go to work, we were trying to do serious rhythm studies on a given day, but in the back of our minds, if we had any minds, was that this is just enjoyable to study something that is truly interesting. Biological clocks, daily rhythms, every day, all day, and the next day, and the next, and the next, and the next. And it, the more I got into rhythm research, the more I realized that they're universal. Every category of organism has biological clocks. So it, and some phenomena, of course, are limited only to certain types of organisms. They're esoteric. Rhythms are not esoteric.